You see them sometimes, walking around blindly with dead eyes, following orders, not knowing what they do, not caring. You mean like Democrats? He's a former radio news director, political columnist, and associate editor for townhallfinance.com. Nice. Not thrilling, but nice. This is Sunday Night with Michael Schaus. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me sure. Now, I will not be angry. Here's Schaus. Good Sunday evening. I'm Michael Schaus. 710 you ask. And I got to tell you, hooray. It's Oscar Sunday, which I know that is so important to you, understandably. Um, so important to me, I, I completely forgot about it. Now, I was thinking about it earlier today, though, when somebody brought it up. And uh, Obama's already received the Nobel Peace Prize without doing anything to actually help perpetuate peace on this planet. Do you think maybe he should just get an Oscar for just being, basically? It's one of the few things that he doesn't have yet. Um, oh, on a related note, uh, since we were talking about the Nobel Peace Prize, ISIS, which I think is pretty much Barack Obama's fault, uh, they recently held a military parade in Libya in an effort to prove that their caliphate is growing. Now, the Obama administration was very quick to remind us that parades have absolutely nothing to do with the religion of Islam whatsoever. And uh, this is this is uh, part of what has just been circling the Internet and news cycles this last week is little Barack Obama's Violent Extremism Summit. Yeah, those were air quotes, by the way. Violent Extremism Summit. It had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Islam, which is why they invited a bunch of Islamic leaders rather than, you know, Lutheran church study groups or something. And and what's really interesting is they um they said that they were avoiding the focus on Islam during during this uh this summit, and yet a bunch of quote unquote reformist Muslim groups groups that are outwardly uh, trying to disassociate Islam with ISIS people that are out there talking about the need for reformation in Islam they were kept out of this summit. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Now that of course brings us to uh, we're just going to get it out of the way early tonight. The 90 seconds of Barack Obama. 90 seconds of Barack Obama. We only do 90 seconds of Barack Obama on this program because, A, that's all the more he really says that's actually worth listening to is about 90 seconds each week. Second of all, any more than 90 seconds, and uh, I generally want to grind sandpaper against my eyes until until they start to bleed. It's just I can't stand this man for any more than 90 seconds. It might explain why I really, really, really hated college, because he sounds like a college professor talking down to me. Now, three interesting pieces here. Last week, when there were a lot of discussions about radical Islam. I had to fill in for John Ransom on John Ransom Show, Ransom Notes Radio, which you can find on townhallfinance.com and on the Wall Street Business Network. And it's something that we talked about a lot last week, because it just kept on coming up. Every time you think the administration would say something stupid... They'd come out and they'd say something even more mind-numbingly dumb. Here's uh, Let's just start with this one. I think this was the highlight of last week. Here in America, Islam has been woven into the fabric of our country since its founding. Generations. Wow. See, you learn something new every day. President Barack Obama says that Islam has been woven into the fabric of our country since its founding. Now... My question is, does he mean before or after we declared war on the Muslim pirates on the Barbary Coast? Because that's our first real interaction with Muslims, as far as America goes, was the Barbary Wars. You know, it's it's in the song for the U.S. Marines. Of course, you know, the guy, uh, guy didn't stop there. The first Islamic center in New York City was founded in, in the 1890s. Neat. America's first mosque, this was an interesting fact, was in North Dakota. Okay, quick question. Got to stop this, North Dakota. Where the heck did that come from? Is he, is he pulling a Hillary Clinton and his his accent is changing? I mean, I never realized how much Native Hawaiians who grew up in Indonesia sound like North Dakotans. But you know, that's uh, that's again, you learn something new every single day. All right, we'll give you more than ten seconds at a time of Barack Obama. <sighs> Here he is talking about how we all are just basically too dumb to distinguish ISIS from normal, peaceful, everyday, average, wonderful Islamic folks. I'd like to close by speaking very directly to a painful truth that's part of the challenge that brings us here today. In some of our countries, including the United States, 
Muslim communities are still small and rel you know, relative to the entire population. And as a result, many people in our countries don't always know personally somebody who is Muslim. So the image they get of Muslims or Islam is in the news. And given the existing news cycle, that can give a very distorted impression. Yeah. Very distorting. I get it, President Barack Obama. I get it. You don't have to keep on saying it over and over. I think most Americans get it. Not all Muslims are radical, violent extremists who are going to behead somebody just because they're a Jew or a Christian. And by the way, not all Germans were Nazis. We're able to actually draw this type of distinction. You don't have to keep on saying it over and over. At the end of the day, who is it that we're afraid of right now? Who is it that's threatening Europe? Who is it that's threatening Israel? Who is it that's threatening the United States? All right. It's not a bunch of suicide nuns. We've talked about this. It would be a fantastic name for a band, but they don't actually exist. There's no such thing as suicide nuns. They aren't running. You know, the Vatican's not talking about uh, the need to retake half of the world and kill everybody that disagrees with them. That's not going on today. All right. What's going on today right now is a caliphate in the middle of uh, middle of the Middle East. That is, uh, they're they're very busy waging a genocidal war on the population there. And they're not content just messing up their own corner of the world. No, 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 they're very excited to mess up the rest of the world. They're very excited to influence people who are already here in America, people that are already in Europe. I mean, anybody else notice, by the way, all the, uh, all the you know, shootings and what have you that are going on in Europe? Isn't that weird, given the strict level of gun control in there? Just... You know, food for thought. Look at this, Copenhagen. You remember Copenhagen, of course, and there was this uh, guy who decided that he was going to, in the name of Allah, start shooting at some people. Well, he got shot by cops. At least 500 Muslim mourners attended the funeral for that Copenhagen terrorist. 500. You know, this is, Mr. President, if you were serious about combating radical uh, extremism, you would at least have the guts to talk about the biggest problem facing the industrialized and Western world today, which it's not some sort of a radical... Can you look, the Department of Homeland Security says that right-wing radicals, yeah, you know, people who believe in the sovereignty of the citizen, are just as big a threat as Islamic terrorists. The Department of Homeland Security said that in a quote-unquote leaked report, and now it wasn't really leaked so much as spoon-fed to a willing media... But the point is, this is the way the administration looks at it. They see people here in America who are just right wing as an equal threat as those folks in ISIS who just beheaded 21 Coptic Christians in Libya. I mean, that's scary. How do you expect them to take and keep us safe if they're doing that? 303-696-1971, 303-696-1971. We are going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, we also have a couple of great guests for you. Of course, we've got we've got Gail Trotter, the smartest woman in Washington, D.C. She'll be joining us in the 9 o'clock hour. We've got Laura Carno before then, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit about Second Amendment rights because there's a whole slew of Second Amendment stories coming out, Just not just here uh, stateside, but, I mean, not just here in, in Colorado but also nationally and even across the pond. You know that there's a, uh, a group of people now in Europe who are pushing to make sure that Jews in Europe have access to carry a gun. And that, um, this is Europe we're talking about. They don't really like guns. And yet there's a, growing, there's a growing trend in Europe right now that says, no, 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 we need to be able to defend ourselves because the government's obviously incapable of doing it. When you look at the Charlie Hebdo attacks, when you look at what happened in Copenhagen, the government is not capable of keeping us safe all the time. This is one of the reasons why uh, gun training, for example, is so, so uh, it, it's, it's very, very widespread in a place like Israel. Because they understand you need to know how to defend yourself if you're going to successfully defend yourself. Even Vladimir Putin last year, this absolutely blew my mind. Vladimir Putin last year made it possible for people who are Russian citizens to not only purchase a handgun, but carry a handgun. In Russia now, you can get a concealed carry permit. But in Washington, D.C., you know, America, where we actually have a Second Amendment, we actually have enumerated our God-given right, or I'm sorry, excuse me, our Allah-given right, because apparently, um, you know, Muslim society has been with us ever since the beginning. 
we can't get a concealed carry permit in Washington, D.C. But if you were a Russian living in Russia, if you were in Moscow walking around, you could have a HK-45 on your hip, no problem. 303-696-1971, 303-696-1971. We'll be right back after this on 710 KNUS. Hi, this is Steve Kelly, and I'd like to welcome Hearing Healthcare Associates to the Kelly's Heroes list. Hearing healthcare experts with over 30 years' experience who donate hearing aids to underprivileged children for every hearing aid they sell. Learn more about the Kelly's Heroes list at khlist.com. That's khlist.com, or go to Hearing Healthcare Associates at hearing-healthcare-associates.com. Hearing-healthcare-associates.com. Psoriasis and vitiligo are serious diseases. You've tried everything and have been disappointed. Now there's Extract, a breakthrough treatment that provides long-lasting, safe relief. Extract is FDA cleared for the treatment of psoriasis and vitiligo and is endorsed by thousands of dermatologists and hospitals because it works. Clinical studies show immediate results with up to 95% clearance. The in-office visits are fast, painless, with virtually no side effects. With thousands of providers treating patients all over the country, Extract is covered by all major insurance companies and Medicare. We'll help you find a doctor close by and there is no cost to you until you see results. Get your life back. Live free. Live extract clear. For your no-cost treatment, call now. 800-963-0483. That's 800-963-0483. 800-963-0483. Or visit xtracradio.com. Qualified patients. Certain restrictions apply. Results may vary. Craig Silverman here. I want to tell you about the estate planning lawyer that I trust. His name is Michael Bailey. He focuses on estate planning, tax law, and elder law. Have you been putting off making a will? Tax laws are changing all the time. So is Colorado estate law. Michael Bailey is on top of the law when it comes to end-of-life planning. We never know when our end will be, but we do know that the law of Colorado will take over, so you should take advantage of that law. Michael Bailey specializes in preparing documents such as wills, trusts, powers of attorney, and defenses against the IRS. And if IRS disputes are already in process, they can help you too. The initial consultations are free. Weekend and evening appointments are available. At the Michael Bailey Law Office, you'll be able to speak directly with an experienced attorney about your needs. So call Michael Bailey, 720-394-6887. That's 720-394-6887 or online at mblawllc.com. According to Forbes magazine, Saudi Arabia's Prince Al-Walid with over $21 billion is the 35th richest person in the world. Being a Saudi prince, you just naturally assume he inherited his money, which I'm sure is partly true. However, he made a lot of his money by investing in banking and financial services, hotels and hotel management companies, mass media, entertainment, retail, agriculture, petrochemicals, aviation technology, and real estate all over the world. He's making money off about anything people buy anywhere. You may not be a Saudi prince, but you can make money on about anything people buy almost anywhere by getting your free blue card. The Blue Card is a loyalty rewards card that not only gets you discounts on purchases, but up to 5% cash back on what you buy. If you refer someone to the Blue Card, you could earn money on what they buy. And if you refer the Blue Card to a business, you could earn on the purchases of anyone who uses the Blue Card in their store or almost anywhere. There's a billion reasons why you should call 800-685-7470 and get your free Blue Card. That's 800-685-7470. You make the decision to buy the home, then you're faced with what's what's next. What do we do? We started at Realtor.com. Realtor.com gave us a lot more current information. Listings are pulled directly from the MLS every 15 minutes. Once you've gone through all of that, the Realtor makes it happen. We worked with the Realtor that really knew the area. And he knew the market. When you have someone who has the expertise, it makes it so much easier. Realtor.com and Realtors. Together, we make home happen. Realtors are members of the National Association of Realtors. All coughs aren't the same, and neither are all cough medicines. Robitussin DM Max is a fast, powerful cough medicine with a unique dual-action liquid that instantly soothes your throat and relieves even the toughest coughs that can come with a cold. Wet. <coughs> dry. <coughs> and hacking. <coughs> Don't let a cough control you. Control your cough with Robitussin DMX. Soothe your throat. Relieve your cough. And don't suffer the consequences. Use as directed. From the Colorado Business Roundtable Studios, this is News Talk 710, KNUS, Denver. 
We now return to Sunday Night with Michael Schaus. News Talk 710 KNUS. Welcome back. 303-696-1971. 303-696-1971 is my telephone number. If there's something on your mind, let me know about it. You can also go to rightwingimage.com. is um, is a website that I've got up. It's got links to all the stuff that I do on Town Hall and, of course, stuff that we do here at 710 KNUS. It also has got a bunch of uh, digital extras, so to speak, and videos and stuff like that uh, for the show, some of which we'll use on the air, some of which eh, don't necessarily translate that well to radio because they're more of a visual medium, but you can you can certainly go there and check it out. You can also uh, you can also email me and connect with me digitally that way. I do have a Facebook and a Twitter account. However, my Facebook and Twitter account are atrociously neglected because I hate Facebook. And uh, quite frankly, I'm too... I'm, I don't... I don't know. Twitter's not really my thing. 140 characters. I don't feel like I'm really getting a whole lot done. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a rambler. I tend to talk a lot. Hundred, You limit me to 140 characters, and there's just not a whole lot of good that's going to come out of that. Uh, but again, rightwingimage.com. Uh, you can also email me, Michael, at rightwingimage.com. Now, the Islamic State is planning on using Libya as a launching pad for European terrorist operations. This is what they say, and this is what they're uh, announcing. Italy is a little freaked out about it. They're they're getting prepared. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is the same Libya that the Obama administration initially claimed was a beacon of hope in the early days of the Arab Spring. We've apparently been benghazi And I do want to talk a little bit more about that. I want to talk about Rudolph Giuliani's comments, uh, saying essentially that he does not think Barack Obama loves this country. And we're going to cover that, I promise. Uh, and we're going to dive into that a little bit with Gail Trotter later on in the show. But before we rant about Obama's Wiley Coyote strategy for countering radical Islam, a uh, couple of other stories just to get you in the mood for our next guest. We're going to have Laura Carno talking a little bit about Second Amendment issues with us. And these, uh, these two stories, well, you know what? No, let's do three. These three stories ought to get you in the right mood. First of all, let's start with a story that is going to, um, well, that's going to frustrate you a little bit. Okay, this is like nails on a chalkboard because this happens all the time. A 72-year-old in New Jersey is facing the possibility of 10 years in prison for having an antique flintlock pistol in his possession. He got pulled over by the cops. The cops ended up uh, searching his car. He really probably should have said no. But, you know, he's he's a 72-year-old who's never been in trouble with law enforcement. He's a good guy. He knows he has nothing to hide. So the cops found this flintlock pistol from the mid-1700s. We're talking pre-revolutionary war here. The pistol was unloaded. There was no powder. There, were, there was no, uh, you know, n- no ball. Just the gun. And yet, the 72-year-old retired teacher was charged with a felony and later marched out of his house in handcuffs. Now, his attorney has said that uh, basically the way that New Jersey law is written, it doesn't matter that it's an antique firearm that was essentially inoperable because you didn't have any of the things like powder or bullets to make it work. That doesn't matter. New Jersey law treats it the same as if he had a 44 Magnum loaded on his hip. This guy had a flintlock pistol wrapped up in a in a sheet, by the way. Oh, and he's not even a gun guy. The reason why he got it is because he collects things from around the era of uh, the Revolution. And so he wanted to put it up there with his copy of the Constitution and what have you, which is a little bit ironic. He's going to put a flintlock pistol next to the Constitution, and now he's facing 10 years for how he was transporting that flintlock pistol. Yeah, and this is what happens when you suspend the Constitution of the United States for, quote-unquote, common sense gun control. Now, with that little story just kind of festering, all right, because if you're anything like me, I read that, and I feel that is a tragedy. And if Chris Christie has any, any dreams or desires to go uh, be popular on the national stage among Republicans, he's going to have to do something about that. Because that story will be trotted out at every single NRA meeting across the country. Now, here's a good story. Here's a story that will make you feel a little bit better, because this is this is a little bit of schadenfreude for you. An anti-gun civil rights lawyer, uh, David Malik, a well-known civil rights lawyer, was arrested Saturday afternoon. This was uh, written last week, so I guess he was actually arrested a week ago. After authorities discovered a handgun in his carry-on bag at a Cleveland 
airport. Anti-gun lawyer caught illegally carrying a gun in the airport. Now, this uh, you know, this, this goes to show that yeah, he had a reasonable excuse, by the way. In all fairness, he had a very reasonable excuse. He wanted all those anti-gun laws to apply to other people, not himself. And this is... This is the attitude among the left. This is the attitude among the anti-gunners. This is the attitude among Mike Bloomberg, who surrounds himself by uh, by people with guns, and then he goes out there and rants and raves about how he needs to take this, these guns away from you. In fact, you know what? We, we mentioned it last week, and I didn't have the audio last week, so I'll play the audio for you right now. Mike Bloomberg was talking um, up in Aspen, and he brought up the fact that we really, really need to get guns out of the hands of minority communities this is what he said now here's the audio it's a little scratchy because i'm sure it was done on somebody's android or iphone or something like that but but i think you'll be able to pick up most of it controversial but the first thing is all of your 95 percent of your murders and murderers and murder victims fit one mo you can just take the description, Xerox it, and pass it out to all the cops. They are male minorities, 15 to 25. That's true in New York. It's true in virtually every city. Okay, I don't know if you caught all that, but he said that 95% of the homicides that occur, 95% of the gun violence that occurs, you could basically Xerox the uh, description of the guy and give them to cops, and they go find him because it would be a black male between the ages of 18 and I think he said 26. And he said this is true in New York, but it's true throughout the country. Now, here's what's interesting to me. He then goes on to explain that in order to save these poor souls, you need to strip them of their gun rights. You need to take guns away from them. As if most of these people committing these crimes are, I don't know, legally acquiring guns. I always thought it was a little weird that, you know, you would think a drug dealer would wander into Bob's Tackle and Sporting Goods shop and and buy an 870 pump-action shotgun. I just, I don't see that happening a whole lot. You know, especially in some place like New York, you realize how difficult it is to get a gun and keep a gun legally in New York? A poor person can't do it. Mike Bloomberg's gun legislation, Mike Bloomberg's gun control proposals have always been the same. And it's the the same as uh, most of the Brady campaign's gun proposals. Anti-gun comp- proposals. It's it's the same as the Southern Democrats in the 1940s and 1930s. It's the same as the Democrat Party proposed right after the Civil War. You create regulation and you create bureaucratic cost around the around the right to own a gun. And what happens is you end up weeding out anybody who's not an elite. If Mike Bloomberg wanted to carry a gun on his person in New York City, he'd be able to do it. Because he's rich. The guy is the guy is unbelievably wealthy. You know, I mean, take a take a million dollars and go to New York, I guarantee you you'll within a couple of weeks you'll be able to legally carry a gun, almost any gun that you want in New York City, so long as it's not on a federal ban. But the average guy who's living in the ghettos, the average family that's living in the ghettos, they can't own a shotgun for personal protection at their house. So what Mike Bloomberg misses, what he seems to completely, and I don't even think he misses it, I just don't think he cares. He is uh, basically taking the same tact as the post-Civil War racist Democrats. Disenfranchise, de-arm the poorest among us, the, those people that are most susceptible to uh, violence, to gangs, those that are most susceptible to horrific crime rates. Disarm them and disenfranchise them, all for the name of their safety. And it's worked out really well for places like Europe, right? European criminals and terrorists have roughly 67 million guns to choose from. That's despite the strict gun control in, in Europe. Yeah, Officials say that there are roughly 67 million guns that criminals in Europe can get. And and they say that it's pretty easy. It's almost as easy as uh, buying drugs somewhere. In England, for, a sec- for example, there are a number of places where you can just, you, you wander up and you find a gun, an illegal gun dealer. 
In Denmark, handguns and semi-automatic rifles are pretty much all but banned. Handing rifles are legal only if you have squeaky clean background checks and you jump through a bunch of bureaucratic hoops. And yet, if you want an illicit assault rifle, such as the one used by that 22-year-old who uh, opened fire in a Copenhagen cafe, all it takes is a couple of connections, mostly through drug dealers. So who ends up having the guns in a society like that, Mike Bloomberg? It ends up being the poorest, the most susceptible to violence. It ends up being the radicals and the extremists. And that's what's happening in places like Chicago. That's what's happening in places in, like Washington, D.C. And that's what's been happening in New York for decades. 303-696-1971. Plenty more straight ahead on 710 KNUS. <laughs> The next Kelly and Company, will there be more fallout from Rudy Giuliani's comments about the president not loving America? And should the Republicans distance themselves? Or is that playing right into the Democrats' hands? Also, sounds like we're getting ready to weather the weather. Will it materialize? Don Day will be on with us. And also an update on the plans at the police memorial this Saturday. Kelly and Company, weekday afternoons from 1 to 4. News Talk 710 KNUS. In 2002, a National Sleep Foundation poll found that 63% of women experience symptoms of insomnia at least a few nights per week. In my opinion, a major reason for insomnia is the blue card. It's a shopping and loyalty card, and it's free. That's right, free. No charge, nada. Next, you can receive up to 5% cash back on purchases. Most cards only offer 2% at most. No wonder girls can't sleep. With the blue card, you can also get shopping points that you could use for online purchases. So it's cash back and shopping points. Am I keeping you awake? If you refer the blue card to someone, you could even earn money on their purchases. No, I'm serious. It's true. But it gets better. If you share the blue card with a merchant, you could earn on the purchases of everyone who uses the blue card at their store, too. There's no way you're going to get any sleep until you get your own free blue card. So call 800-685-7470 and order your free blue card so you can rest easy again. Call 800-685-7470. We gave Tom 12 seconds to give six reasons why he opened a Mathnasium Learning Center franchise. Okay. (laughs) Great income potential. Doing good for kids. Doing what I love. Making math make sense to kids. 500 centers open already. One every three days. Mathnasium taught me the business. Helps me. Supports me. Time's up. Pretty good. (laughs) For franchise information, visit mathnasium.com or take the first step right now call 855-361-MATH that's 855-361-6284 man oh man am i excited to tell you about my favorite jewelry store william crow jewelers i had one of my father's old watches that i wanted to wear william crow fixed it up just right and for the right price they've been in downtown denver since 1924 and counting a great family-run enterprise that treats its customers like you're part of the family. They're jewelry experts at design. You come in with an idea, they'll make it for you. Not by sending it out of the building, by doing the work themselves. Certified gemologists and a great sales staff who never work on a commission. Just go in and look around. You'll be stunned by the collections, including vintage and antique and state jewelry at fantastic prices. Nobody buys diamonds better and sells them to you for less. Family-owned since 19. 19- 24, 16th in Champa in the historic University Building, validated parking right across the street. Give them a call, 303-592-1695, online at williamcrow.com. William Crow Jewelers, making Denver sparkle since 1924. Hey, Mark, Karen, and I hear that the Denver real estate market is hot now, so I'm looking to sell our house. But we want to keep as much of our equity from the sale of our home as possible. You've sold a few properties. What advice can you give me? Well, I made a great profit when selling those properties using ColoradoHouseListing.com. I was able to sell my homes quickly. Plus, you know, they gave me a lot of different options on how I could sell for top dollar. They even allowed me to sell my homes myself if I wanted to. They offer everything from full broker services to a unique shown-by-owner program and worked with me around my schedule. Now, you're going to need another home to move into, so they have a bunch of exclusive listings not found on any other site. Go ahead and type their website into your laptop and see for yourself. What was the site again? Colorado House listing.com Wow, Mark, you were right. I think I'll list my home with them. Whether you're looking to buy, sell, or invest for all of your real estate needs, visit coloradohouselisting.com coloradohouselisting.com Sunday night with Michael Schultz. News Talk 710 KNUS Welcome back. 
back. I am Michael Schaus. This is Sunday Nights with Michael Schaus, which we spent a really, 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 really long time coming up with that name because we wanted to just we wanted to blow your mind with our creativity. And so Sunday Nights with Michael Schaus, it's so simple. We figured that it'd throw you off a little bit. Um, now, we've got one of my favorite uh, people to talk about gun rights and, and very excited to introduce her from IamCreatedEqual.com is the website, IamCreatedEqual.com. Laura Carno. Laura, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Now, I, I, uh, we, we talked actually earlier in the week on another program, and, and I love the idea of using gun rights as a barometer for individual freedom, because I think generally speaking, you look at places in America where gun rights are more um, prolific and, and people tend to have more individual liberty, and then places where uh, the authorities have clamped down on gun rights, you tend to have far less economic freedom. You tend to have far less uh, social freedom. How, how do you think about that? Right, and and I like to look at it from a standpoint of what does the government trust citizens with? And this is an international question. I like to say here in the United States, it's about citizens trusting the government or not trusting the government. Not it shouldn't be the other way around. But but when you see a government that that trusts citizens uh, with firearms, uh, they also trust them to make economic decisions, and so it really is a good barometer for freedom overall. Yeah, I mean, we can tr- be trusted with guns, but, you know, that health care, we really can't be trusted with that. Clearly, we need the government there to tell <laughs> us about that. It's... Right. It, it's very interesting because um, I like consistency in political uh, principle, and and you look at something like that and, and you say, okay, well, the um, – uh, people should be trusted with their choice to have an abortion or not, but they can't be trusted with um, buying health care or buying their health insurance. And so you look at the Democrats and you go, really? You're, you're going to sell that one to us, are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's um, it, it's something that, you know, we hear a lot about on the left is that they're the party of, you know, they're pro-choice, pro-choice Democrats and pro-choice liber- liberals and leftists. And, boy, they're certainly not talking about the choice to, uh, you know, for a woman to, say, carry a 38 with her to protect herself. And and Vox had a I don't know if you saw it but uh, Vox Ezra Klein's liberal little media outlet right. Vox they had this interesting article talking about how guns on campuses women carrying guns on college campuses uh, won't actually do anything to help bring down the sexual assault rate in college campuses because most sexual assaults happen when she's unconscious or something and therefore we just we shouldn't allow anybody to have guns and to me that is that is a bizarre twisted way of looking at things taking away your right to protect yourself because somebody else might get raped in a certain circumstance where she doesn't know it right and it, it when you get into those sorts of uh, descriptions uh with state representatives saying that we should use whistles and call boxes and right. you, know, you you end up with people who gosh if the, if that is the choice that they want to make and I'm glad you said pro choice on firearms and I, I refer to it as a pro-choice on self-defense. If guns aren't for you, don't own one, but don't you dare tell me how to defend myself. And so you have these people saying, well, you shouldn't carry a gun because X, Y, Z, all these things could happen. Great. If, if those are things that are of concern to you, then you certainly shouldn't carry a gun. I don't have those same concerns, so I shall carry a gun. <laughs> so it is a pro-choice thing. Yeah. No, I, I am uh, really happy any time that I hear Michael Bloomberg speak because lately every time he gets out there, he says something stupid and it just discredits credit, him and his movement a little bit more. I've noticed over the last few years, despite things like those three atrocious bills being passed here in Colorado, despite Washington uh, going a little tighter on guns, We've actually seen a lot of positive news coming out of the last year, and there's uh, some potentially positive things happening this year here in Colorado, right? Right. So there have been already five gun bills that have um, gone through the uh, – they started in the House. And remember, the House is a Democrat majority this time, um, or again. um, And so five bills have gone through the Democrat-controlled House committees and been killed. There are a few more that are still scheduled to go through House committees. Um, And then we've got the Senate, which is Republican-controlled. So there have been a couple that have passed the Senate. They'll go over to the House. Uh, The Speaker of the House, Vicki Lee Hollinghorst, has promised that any pro-gun bills that come from the Senate will, um, will die in the House. So we'll see how that all goes if, if 
people put enough pressure on Democrats and on the Speaker's office to actually give them a fair hearing on the House floor. And to me, the, the big interesting one uh, was scheduled for tomorrow at, in the Senate, but they're having a snow day tomorrow at the Capitol, so it'll be rescheduled. But it is a um, a bipartisan bill to repeal the magazine limitation. And if you'll remember, in 2013, uh, the the legislature passed a ban on any magazines that hold over 15 rounds. And so there's this bipartisan effort uh, to repeal it. And uh, three, and it's four Democrats. So three of those four were in one of the cham- one or the other of the chambers in 2013 and voted against the magazine ban. And one is a brand new Democrat senator from Vail, Colorado, pro-gun Democrat from Vail, Colorado, um, who has signed on to this bill. So that's going to be very interesting. And even though it's not happening tomorrow, uh, folks should stay tuned to when that's rescheduled because I think it's going to be very interesting. So are you a little bit more optimistic that that might actually squeak past the the so-called kill committee? Well, on the Senate, it's going to be fine. It'll go through uh, Senate Judiciary and pass. Um, but and that and that's why I think this is so politically interesting is when it gets to the House. Uh, and again, Speaker Hollinghorst has said uh, she's going to make sure that anything that comes over from the Senate gets killed, which we all know means it'll go to the kill committee. Um, but with with all of these Democrats, is there going to be extra pressure on her uh, to to let it get through committee and let it get a full hearing on the House floor? Well, I think, you know, especially being in Colorado, I mean, one of the reasons why I like Colorado is because I feel like we're pretty independently minded. I mean, we're talking about a state that legalized marijuana and then shortly thereafter kicked a couple of lawmakers out of office because those lawmakers tried to infringe on their gun rights. And I don't think that's really a marijuana issue or a gun issue or anything else. It's exactly what we were talking about before, the the idea that I as an individual should be able to choose what I can or cannot do. And something as absurd as limiting the number of bullets I can have in a magazine uh, should should be a kind of bipartisan thing in Colorado where even Democrats in Colorado should say, well, wait a second, how many of my guns is that going to impact? Right. And. And when we talked about this in uh, in 2013, when that bill was going through, you know, this is a women's issue. Uh, when you limit the ability of of any gun owner uh, to carry, you limit the number of rounds. Uh, women are always disparately impacted by this because women are statistically smaller than their attacker, and the only thing that you have to be able to uh, you know, be that great equalizer as a, a firearm for a woman to make sure that she has that ability to choose uh, w- whatever firearm she wants. And you know, what about multiple attackers? There, there are all kinds of things where women are are really impacted. Um, and and so I, I think there are a lot of reasons that this is sort of seen as bipartisan. And I'll point to one statistic, Michael, in Pueblo in 2013. When Senator Angela Heron was recalled, Democrat Senator Angela Heron, 4,000 Democrats voted yes for recall in wow. that very, very Democrat district. And that just tells you guns are not just a Republican issue. Yeah, certainly not. I think, um, you know, especially in a place like, like Colorado, you know, Colorado is a whole lot different than some place like New York. And I think that was a big part of what made Coloradans so upset about these three bills is we felt like it was Mike Bloomberg from New York City uh, coming in, influencing maybe some of our legislators and some of, you know, our our governor and kind of pushing his East Coast elitist big city belief on places like Pueblo, Colorado or Fort Morgan, Colorado or, or, you know, Denver, Colorado. Right. Yeah. People felt like we were getting bossed around by this billionaire. (laughs) And, uh, you know, as his group likes to say that, you know, it's the NRA is, is pushing people around. And and I, I look at it really differently that the NRA is 5 million or so people just like me who pay our $25 a year. Michael Bloomberg is one billionaire bossing a bunch of people around. The NRA would be nothing without 5 million of us. And so it's, it's very interesting to um, look at, at those two sides of, uh, you know, you've got a lot of words being thrown around during political campaigns, but... 
uh, one billionaire trying to boss people around does come across very differently to the electorate. No, I'll tell you what, at least, you know, good for us is uh, the fact that Mike Bloomberg is kind of an incompetent billionaire when it comes to these things. Some of the videos that he did, when you get the ladies on The View to say, oh, yeah, I would I would own a gun. That poor lady in that commercial needed a gun. I mean, that's that's telling you that, OK, Mike Bloomberg, your messaging might have been off on that. Right. I, I don't know anybody who looked at that. Uh, I know that commercial you're talking about who looked at that and said, gosh, it's going to be sad when that woman dies at the hands of her violent ex. Um, I think everybody came to that same conclusion that we all came to. Gosh, I, I'd like her to be able to defend herself. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, that's really what it's what it boils down to. So with Colorado, hopefully maybe maybe some some good news. I do know that there's been a lot of rumblings about um, concealed carry on campuses on college campuses and and stuff like well even maybe public school campuses do you see any of that going um getting a little bit more traction in the next couple of years um so patrick neville state representative right. is sponsoring a bill to allow uh, concealed carry on k-12 through campuses he was a student at columbine during the columbine shooting and now he's a state representative his father's a state a uh, state senator and so that will be a very interesting uh, testimony to hear because usually when you have the bills that talk about concealed carry on K-12 campuses or even on college campuses, you inevitably hear from people who are on, Col- on Columbine's campus during the shooting that uh, think there should be fewer guns, not more guns. And so to have Patrick's viewpoint on that as a student who was there during the shooting uh, will just be a very different take on it. I'm very interested to see how that goes. Yeah, I think at the very least it might uh, ratchet up the conversation about it, which is probably the first step because, as we pointed out, we've got a divided government in Colorado right now, and that's that's both a good thing and a bad thing. The good you know, good news is we're not going to get any more draconian gun legislation. The bad side is uh, we're probably not going to be able to repeal a whole lot of a whole lot of the damage that was done previously. Um, on the on the federal level. I guess the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is uh, they've decided to ban a type of ammunition that's popular among AR-15 enthusiasts. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, um, yeah a little bit. Um, the so as as we've seen with this president, when he can't get laws passed, he goes to his uh, regulatory agencies to try and get them passed. So there are a number of different um, words being used: ball ammunition, uh, armor-piercing ammunition. Um, all kinds of things that, that the ATF is going to look to ban. Now, when I say armor-piercing ammunition, this is a standard 223 round that a lot of people have, and they actually are not armor-piercing. But the ATF is saying, well, if we can recategorize different ammo as armor-piercing, then we can try and make that illegal. Um, there's, they're in the 30-day feedback period for that right now. Um, so people should definitely provide feedback that – uh, these things should not be banned. And there will be a, a, a big backlash from the gun community on this uh, for having this done through a regulatory agency and not through legislation. I, I think something that we're going to see, and this is kind of a bolder prediction, but I think that over the next few years you're going to see uh, gun manufacturers and, and bigger businesses that are associated with that starting to um, – starting to become a little bit more vocal. I was telling somebody earlier, Para Ordinance, for example, said, that's it, we're not going to be related to anything that Liam Neeson does, because Liam Neeson came out with some very anti-gun uh, comments. And and I think you're going to see a little bit more of that, because uh, I feel that these businesses, just like gun owners, these businesses are starting to get a little tired of being pushed around by a by a nanny state. Sure. And in 2000, at the end of 2013, a new poll came out, um, a majority now, 52% of Americans, believe that gun rights need to be protected more than we need more gun control. We're at a majority now, and uh, so I think you'll start seeing things like that, um, more pro-gun Democrats, more companies willing to speak out, those sorts of things. So, Laura Carno, where can people go to learn a little bit more and, and see what you're up to? Sure. So they can go to lauracarno.com. I actually have a blog on the bipartisan uh, mag ban repeal. And then um, they should also check out my blog called Crushing the American Dream, uh, which talks about the attempt on the part of the Colorado State Legislature to ban a product called powdered alcohol before it ever hits the market. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we, we've <laughs> talked about that. It'll be another example of, hey, I'm serious. It's a matter of time until uh, the Democrats in Colorado try to do something with my high-capacity soda. 
It right. really is. You're absolutely right. All right, Laura, I appreciate you taking the time out tonight. It's it's always great to talk to you, always great to get a feel on what's happening in the uh, in the gun world. Again, Laura Carno, I know one of her websites I really like is IamCreatedEqual.com. You should definitely check that out. Uh, when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. And uh, at 9 o'clock, of course, we'll have Gail Trotter, smartest woman in Washington, D.C. Plenty more on 710 KNUS. News Talk 710. Hi, it's Peter Boyles. I'm here with my friend Karen with the Fresh Fish Company. The Fresh Fish Company is open 33 years ago. Karen was right out of high school. We started being friends then, and here we are years later. When it comes to seafood, my three favorite words, delivered fresh daily. I love coming to the place. Karen, it's wonderful. It's on Hamden and the Tiffany Plaza. And we love having you dine with us, Pete. Fresh is in our name for a reason. Fresh quality seafood is our specialty. We feature mesquite wood grilling and offer Denver's largest seafood selection. We serve over 20 varieties of fresh fish, shellfish, and mouth-watering prime rib and steaks. Our specialties include live main lobsters, crab legs, and calamari. And you'll love our San Francisco-style sourdough bread. The Fresh Fish Company, the place I bring my friends, bring my family. It's a great place for lunch. Karen, what's the best way to make a reservation? Make reservations at thefreshfishco.com or you can call Call us at 303-740-9556. So come enjoy seafood delivered fresh daily at one of my favorite places, the Fresh Fish Company. Nothing can destroy a life faster than addiction. I've been there and almost lost everything. After many attempts at recovery, I finally found success. I needed to focus on what was driving my poor decisions. Why was I hurting myself and others around me? I needed a safe place where I could get sober and learn new ways of dealing with my addictions. Hi, I'm Eric Lapp, founder of the Raleigh House of Hope Addiction Treatment Centers. At the Raleigh House, right here in Denver, our clients experience a foundational transformation. We use a unique holistic approach that combats the psychological and biological components of addiction. Our skilled team can empower you or your loved one to become strong and healthy. You've been thinking about getting help for some time. Now is the time to take control of your life. Visit TheRileyHouse.com to see stories of past clients whose lives have been transformed. Call The Riley House at 720-620-5535 to start recovery today. Most forms of private insurance are accepted. Call 720-620-5535 or visit RileyHouse.com. Do you have a municipal or city court criminal record which has been haunting you? Has your state court record of a petty offense entered your job search? Up until recently, all municipal and city court criminal records and state court petty offenses were permanent and could not be sealed. Hi, this is your criminal defense lawyer, Terry O'Malley. Under a new Colorado law, after three years have passed since your case is completely over, you can petition a court to seal any municipal conviction or any state court petty offense as long as you don't have any new convictions since that case was final. This new law is a wonderful way to put one-time mistakes behind you. Young people can effectively erase childhood mistakes like shoplifting or an MIP, which have kept them from getting a job. Disorderly conduct and harassment charges can be sealed. Many public lands trespassing and hunting offenses can be erased from your record. State court petty offenses for marijuana can now be sealed. To learn more about this great new record sealing law, call the O'Malley Law Office lawyers at 303-830-0880. Again, 303-830-0880. Since 1985, Office Liquidators have been saving you money on new and used office furniture while offering Colorado's largest selection from their huge showroom. They have hundreds of good quality used desks, chairs, conference tables, and files to choose from. They also carry over 30 brands of new furniture, including manufacturers like Han and National. This month, they're slashing prices on their best-selling mesh back chairs. All have been reduced to over 50% off list, starting as low as $149 with the best selection in the state. They will have a chair that is right for you. KNUS listeners receive an extra 20% off any sale chair. Simply mention you heard this ad on KNUS. Go to officeliquidators.com now to check out their great specials and money-saving coupons. So if you're looking for great deals on new or used furniture, visit their showroom at 6 and Sims in Lakewood. Go online at officeliquidators.com or give them a call at 303-759-DESK. That's 303-759-DESK. Now, back to Sunday Night with Michael Schaus, News Talk 710, KNUS. Welcome back, 303-696-1971, 303-696-1971. You can also check me out on uh, rightwingimage.com. Email is michael at rightwingimage.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. If you go to that website, click on it. And you can find me on townhallfinance.com. Look at that, I'm everywhere. So the uh, this from Stripes, and a little off topic, I understand, but I need to share it with you. I uh, wrote something a while ago, last week sometime, about 
the fact that the well, apparently the uh, the military, the actual active duty military members are shrinking because President Barack Obama is trying to cut the defense. Uh, he claims he's cutting the defense budget, but really he's just cutting our defense, cutting our military ability. The civilians in the military, however, you know, civilian administrators and bureaucrats, yeah, that's going up at, at a very, very alarming rate. The military now is going to have to accommodate transgender individuals and they will have civilian officials overseeing the military's acceptance of LGBT groups. L- LGB, L- lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. Okay, yeah, there are probably a couple of other initials in there are missing. So we're going to have civilian officials watching the military's acceptance of LGBT groups. Why? Well, because having a uniformed and cohesive military unit is not as important as being fabulous, apparently. That's, it, that's really the only thing... That I can see from this, and this is this is interesting, at a time when the world is clearly a more dangerous place, this is the concern of the military right now. Make sure that transgendered individuals feel, feel accepted in the U.S. Marine Corps. That's what we should be worried about. Not maybe, I don't know, not, not securing our embassies in the Middle East, not putting a halt to ISIS, not helping uh, Israel stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. We'll talk all about that and more here in a minute. But first, I've got another piece of audio I want to share with you. Do you remember six years ago, uh, last Friday, six years ago last Friday, what happened on that day? It's kind of an important day, at least if you're a right-wing, you know, capitalist pig such as myself, an important day. Because that was the day that on CNBC, they cut to Rick Santelli, who, uh, he well, he went on a little bit of a rant. A rant about the mortgage bailout, a rant about the... Seven-eighths of a trillion dollars that we had just spent for, quote-unquote, shovel-ready jobs. Rick Santelli, six years ago, last Friday, ranted and raved about the need for another Tea Party. This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay their bills? Raise their hand. How about we all... President Obama, are you listening? How about it. we all stop paying our mortgage? It's a moral hazard. <laughs> hey, Rick, how about the notion that Wilbur pointed out you can go down to two percent on the mortgage? You can go down to minus two percent and still have forty percent and still have forty percent not be able to do it. So why are they in the house? Why are we trying to keep I mean, them I in the house? I know Mr. Summers is a great economist, but boy, I'd love the answer to that one. Jason, Jason, you you, you want to... We're thinking of having a Chicago Tea Party in July. All you capitalists that want to show up to Lake Michigan, I'm going to start organizing. What are you jumping in this time? All right. Tea Party in Chicago in July. That was was the first really big, noticeable Tea Party. It really fired up the crowd uh, among the right. People who were upset with the last couple of years of George W. Bush's big spending policies. And then we're suddenly greeted with a almost trillion dollar stimulus plan. Talk about a mortgage bailout. Oh, and of course, talk about health care reform. Re- reform, using air quotes. Rick Santelli, six years ago, basically sparked the Tea Party. Now, I don't mean this in a really incendiary sort of way, okay? But Washington, D.C. right now is trying to ignore the Tea Party. I mean, look at who the Republicans are trying to coordinate. They're, they're trying to put Jeb Bush Jeb Bush, look, Jeb Bush, I'm sure he's a fine guy. He's not a Tea Party guy, all right? He's not that big of a conservative. I mean, he might be very, very fun at cocktail parties. I don't know. But he's not going to be a conservative leader, a conservative leader. You can't be a conservative leader and say, oh, yeah, Common Core, or as Michael Schaas calls it, Obamacare for education. That's a great idea. So I don't mean to be incendiary, but in uh. You know, in the 1700s, there was a little tea party in Boston, and the colonists got a little uppity when King George tried to ignore them. Washington, D.C., the Republicans and the Democrats, should probably not ignore what happened six years ago. Because while we don't read about a tea party protest on every page, every day, of every newspaper today, we are still seeing the reverberations of the tea party. We're seeing the impact of the tea party. The tea party in six years has grown up a lot. They've become a little bit more organized. They've become a little bit more politically savvy. Whereas before, they were throwing uh, up some candidates who, quite honestly, might have had all the right ideas, but they were completely unelectable. Yeah, Tea Party groups, they've learned. They now know how to put their ideas 
into action using the uh, vehicle of the Republican Party. They know how to use the current political system more than they did six years ago. The Tea Party, I say, is still alive and well. And I want to talk a little bit about that later on tonight, too, because there are a lot of people who think the Tea Party is dead. Well, given what, given the positive attention that Rudy Giuliani is getting for his criticism of Barack Obama's foreign policy, given the outrage there is over Obamacare, I'd have to say the Tea Party is probably more alive today than it was six, five, or even four years ago. Plenty more. Gail Trotter, smartest woman in Washington, D.C. is coming up next.